our Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and redeemer. Amen. I want to begin a little series over the next three weeks meditating on some of the names that the Bible gives to the Son of God, our Lord Jesus. Our own names are very important to us, of course. I'll never forget the day when I was a student here and Mark Thompson remembered, called out, and when I put my hand up and I, Mark Thompson called out Andrew. Uh, and addressed me by my name. And I thought, wow, Mark knows my name. I won't tell you when it was, but it was commendably early in my time at college. I think aiming for some time in second year is a reasonable expectation, don't you think? It was a member of faculty at the time, he's no longer on faculty, of whom it used to be said that you needed to be on faculty for about three years before he'd remember your name. <laughs> At the very least, our names signify that we're real people, don't we? Not just faceless, generic animals, but individuals uh, with our own unique identity and contribution to make to the human family, uh, even if, at least when I was at school, when the teacher called Andrew, five hands would go up. Uh, it's not so much of a problem these days. I think Andrew's one of those names that's sort of been consigned to the dustbin, a bit like, um, I don't know, Rex or something. <laughs> it's a curse now that I seem to have passed on to my, my eldest, William. Uh, it's a very popular name these days. But of course, more than just signalling our own unique identity, it's also true that our names mean something. Now, in my case, for most of my life, I've been tormented by the fear that my own name, which means manly, reflects my parents' aspirations for me and maybe not much else. But when the Bible gives a name like the name Jesus to the one that we know as the Son of God, they're not the mere aspirations of a father who sent him into the world, but they tell us something very true and very fundamental about who he is. Now this morning I want to begin with the name that is first given to us by the prophet Isaiah, in fact, long before Jesus' birth, and quoted for us in Matthew chapter 1 as having been fulfilled when that day finally arrived and the Virgin Mary was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. If you have that chapter open, chapter 1, verse 23, all this took place, Matthew says, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The Virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Now you might remember how Matthew begins his gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy, Matthew begins, of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, in drawing attention to that great prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 7, right at the very moment of Jesus' conception, it's as if Matthew's saying, not only has that long promised seed of Abraham who would bless, that nation, bless the nations, uh, that long promised seed of David, the royal Messiah, not only has he arrived, but the one who has arrived is none other than Emmanuel, God himself, not simply God over us, God above us, ruling the nations from his heavenly throne, but God actually among us, with us, in human flesh and blood, who has come down, as the creed would say, for us and for our salvation. What a staggering name to give this tiny, vulnerable little embryo taking shape in Mary's womb. As Matthew says, at the very least, of course, it signals the fulfilment of prophecy. That's uh, one of Matthew's great concerns in his gospel, and especially in these opening chapters, to show how all the rivers of Old Testament prophecy flow towards this Christ, who is like the ocean who gathers up in his person every promise, every divine action, every shadowy pattern and picture of God's glory and grace. And here, as I say, Matthew is quoting one of those many promises which have now been fulfilled, this one from Isaiah chapter 7. I don't know how much you remember from Isaiah chapter 7, but those were the days when King Ahaz was on the throne of Judah and the great and terrifying Assyrian Empire was on the march. 
And Ahaz is starting to get so desperate that he's tempted to crawl beneath the skirts of surrounding nations for protection. You know, the principle, my enemy's enemy is my friend. But Isaiah comes to Ahaz with a word from the Lord who says, forget about Ephraim, forget about Damascus. They'll only bring Judah to its knees. Be calm, God says. Don't be afraid, just trust me. Ask, and ask for a sign, he says to Ahaz. Ask me to do something public, something marvellous, something you'll be able to see and to touch so that you can say God is surely on our side. But in his folly and pride, Ahaz says, no, no, I'm going to put God to the test. I don't need a sign. And God says, well, you're going to get a sign, whether you like it or not. (laughs) A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. And when that Emmanuel comes, God says, he will only come after I've brought every nation on the face of the earth to their knees. Even my beloved Judah, the apple of my eye, will be brought right to the very brink of extinction before I come to rescue and deliver those few who have waited patiently for me amidst the ashes of my judgment. So this child is the ultimate sign from the Lord. And Matthew understands all this as he traces the line of Abraham, the line of the royal throne from its majestic beginnings when a seemingly invincible David danced his way up to Jerusalem before the Ark of the Lord with shouts of trumpets, all the way down through its eventual disintegration, through the ashes of Babylonian exile, all the way down to this young, insignificant couple, Joseph, a carpenter, from Nazareth and his pregnant teenage fiancée, Mary. No royal palace, no servants, nowhere even except for a manger, it seems, for their child to be born. And right there, right at that darkest moment when the return of God's people to Jerusalem had proven to be a false dawn and the royal line of Judah was nothing more than a distant memory, right there in the dark night of Joseph's sleep, an angel appeared with news that the days of darkness were about to end and there in the womb of Mary was one in whom all the hopes and fears of all the years would finally meet. To quote that carol so beloved of the late Queen Elizabeth. God had kept his word. God had kept his word. But the significance of this extraordinary moment is not simply that God had kept his word, of course. Isaiah speaks of it as a sign. And we might ask, what, in what sense was it a sign? Perhaps Matthew wants us to grasp at least two equally staggering details. First, a virgin. Not merely a young woman, no, a virgin. For whatever else Isaiah might have consciously known or foreseen when that promise was first spoken and written down. There is absolutely no doubt here in terms of the ultimate fulfilment of this promise. Matthew does not want us to miss this staggering detail. Behold, see, look, a virgin shall be with child. A virgin birth. What is the point of the virgin birth? Aside from the sort of incredulity that would lead most modern people to sweep this detail into the dustbin of pre-modern fantasy, even those of us who take it as written, if only because the Bible tells me so, are often left scratching our heads, aren't we? I get why Jesus turned water into wine. I get why Jesus healed the blind. I get why Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I get why Jesus himself rose from the dead. And I get why it makes a difference to me that Jesus rose from the dead. It's the difference between heaven and hell. But why the virgin birth? Rattles mindlessly off our tongues when we say the creed. Born of the Virgin Mary, we say. But when have you stopped and asked what difference that makes to me? Maybe you might expect me to launch into some rarefied excursus about the nature of original sin and the way the virgin birth shields Christ from all that, and that, of course, would be true and may be fun for another day. (laughs) 
But I think there's something much more basic going on. Put it like this, I was helped by this observation. It's striking, I think, that at every critical moment of Jesus' earthly life, there is darkness. The darkness of Mary's womb. The darkness that fell on the land for three hours when Jesus took his final breaths upon the cross. And then the pre-dawn darkness of the empty tomb. I mean, we modern people are inclined to think in only the most emaciated, literalistic fashion about these details. Well, of course it was dark inside Mary's womb. It's a womb, for goodness sake. That's why you get an ultrasound, isn't it, these days? Of course it was dark inside the tomb. There wasn't a candle, let alone an electric light to be seen. What happened to the cross is a bit harder to explain, but, you know, it's not too hard when you think about it. It must have been some sort of solar eclipse, you see. There you go, darkness. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Except to say that at each of these moments of darkness, something extraordinary happens, something completely beyond the scope of our emaciated scientific, mathematical and creative imaginations. Behold... A virgin conceives. Behold, a righteous man dies for the sins of the world. Behold, he rises again from death, never again to die. All in the darkness, hidden, as it were, from every prying eye, so that just as God created light out of darkness way back in the beginning, with just a word, hidden from every prying eye. So God brings light out of darkness once again, the light of recreation and salvation from death, as in the beginning, so now hidden from every prying eye. In the impossible, unfathomable abyss of darkness, away from every prying eye, there God acts. There is no other person here, no human design or imagination, no human power, only the living God himself. But behold, as if to say with a wink in his eye, look at this, beat this, O mortal, a virgin shall conceive. What's the meaning of the virgin birth. Well, it's all of a piece, I think, with the meaning of the cross and the meaning of the resurrection. It's, as, it's God saying to the whole of mortal humanity, move over, get out of the way. Because if there's nothing you did to contribute to your creation in the first place, the only thing you'll ever contribute to your salvation is nothing other than the sin that makes it necessary. Well, if that isn't staggering enough, behold, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son. The second detail about this sign is perhaps even more wondrous still. And he will be called Emmanuel. This is unique. Not even the miracle of creation shares this in common with the virgin birth. I mean, of course, God was present in the act of creation. Of course, God is present in human history, governing history. That's the miracle of his providence. But what happens in this miracle of the virgin birth is without comparison in all the acts of God that have ever been or ever will be. Here is God not merely present within history, but God who becomes part of history. The one who flung the stars into space, who created the vast cosmos, entering the womb of the Virgin Mary in the tininess of the embryonic form no more than a couple of cells at first, totally dependent on his mother's placenta for all of those long months in the fetal position before emerging from Mary's womb in an animal feeding trough at the back of some nondescript house somewhere, surrounded by livestock. Oh, magnum mysterium. Oh, what a great mystery that the animals should see the newborn Lord lying in a manger. 
Lo, within a manger lies he who built the starry skies. He who, throned in height sublime, sits among the cherubim. Sacred infant, all divine, what tender love was thine, thus to come from highest bliss down to a world such as this. Thus to come from highest bliss down to a world such as this. Think of the Queen now in heavenly glory. However much fame and glory she enjoyed in this world, was there ever a more famous, glorious person in this world? However much fame and glory she had in this world, would she now wish to return to a world such as this? Surely not. Surely not. But here is the son who, though rich beyond all splendour, in the highest eternal bliss of his father's love, out of no need or necessity of his own, but surely for our sake, comes down to a world such as this, a world wrecked by the tragedy and disgrace of our sin, to do what none of us could ever do, solving our greatest problem by taking all our poverty and shame upon himself. There isn't a single person among us who can do that. What man can give his life as a ransom for another? No man, no woman. And so God comes down and does it himself. That's what the name Emmanuel means. God with us, from the darkness of the womb to the darkness of the cross to the darkness of the tomb and then at last to the light of eternal glory. I've often bemoaned the way some Christians want to talk up the incarnation at the expense of the cross as if one offers a much more sort of appealing and palatable image of God's love than the other, as if we can sort of prize apart the coloured lights and the tinsel and the feasting of Christmas and do away with all the blood and the gore and the sackcloth of Good Friday. You probably have too. Of course it's a mistake to do that. The two cannot be prized apart. You know that and I know that. But since we're lingering here at the beginning of Jesus' life for the moment, rather than at the end, it's worth stopping and asking what difference the virgin birth makes to the meaning of the cross. What does the incarnation teach us about the cross? I mean, put it like this. Why did God start his journey with us here in Mary's womb? And not, say, in the last Passover week before he died. Or why not the night before he died? Or even the hour before he died? Surely God could have done things that way if he wanted to. But no, instead he began his journey here in Mary's womb. I think it's easy to think of God only as a momentary saviour, is it not? As if God has come to save us only in those big moments moment of catastrophic personal failure, the tragic loss of a loved one, a trial that feels beyond what we can bear, an illness, and if not in for any of those, perhaps just most of all for that moment when the bell finally rings and the curtains are drawn on our lives. But if God has only come for the, those moments then he hasn't come for our waking and sleeping every day. He hasn't come for our bodily aches, for what we put in our mouths or what we read or stare at on a screen, for our hours of labour and rest. He hasn't come for those words spoken to a spouse or a child or a friend or a colleague. He hasn't come for my spending or my debts. In other words, he hasn't come for the sheer ordinariness and banality of every day and every minute of of our lives, which is, let's face it, most of our lives, with all of its idle thoughts and daydreams and all of its careless and callous words and all its false starts and empty promises and regrets and missed opportunities and disappointments and longings and fears. No, he's only come for the big moments, only for the end. But here's the problem. Although we often think of our death as some sort of alien invader that sort of 
crashes in from outside, rudely interrupting all the mundane drudgery of our daily lives. The reality is our deaths are much more like the, the gathering up of our mundane drudgery in every minute and every day of it. And surely that's why those who catch a glimpse of their own impending end are so often just haunted by the vivid, totality, vivid reminders of the totality of the life that they've lived. When someone dies, we are almost irresistibly drawn to recall the totality of a life lived. For dust we are, says the Lord, and to dust we will return. And so the dust that is our death is really no more or less than the dust that is the sum total of our lives. But God hasn't just come for a moment for the end. Surely that's the, what the virgin birth teaches us about the cross. He came right at the beginning so that every moment of his childhood lived in honour and obedience to his parents Every sustained and passing thought, every spoken word, every glance of compassion and touch of a hand upon a shoulder, every moment of fullness and hunger, of labour and rest, of joy and pain, of courage and frailty, every meal shared with his friends, every turn of his heart to his heavenly father, every minute of every hour of every day, all of it lived for us so that all the senseless, broken, scattered fragments of our daily existence might be gathered up into his glorious life and offered upon the cross as a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord so that our lives now might be defined by that self-offering rather than the dust and ashes of what is otherwise our own. Emmanuel, the God who is with us because he has come for us, not just part of us, but all of us, from beginning to end, from cradle to grave. I love how deep, how broad, how high, beyond all thought and fantasy, that God, the Son of God, should take our mortal form for mortal's sake. He sent no angel to our race of higher or of lower place, but wore the robe of human frame, and to this world himself he came. For us, baptised, for us he bore his holy fast and hungered sore. For us, temptation sharp he knew. For us, the tempter overthrew. For us he prayed, for us he taught, for us he da his daily works he wrought by words and signs and actions, thus still seeking not himself but us. For us by wicked men betrayed, for us in crowns of thorns arrayed, he bore the shameful cross and death, for us he gave his dying breath. For us he rose from death again, for us he went on high to reign, for us he sent his spirit here to guide, to strengthen and to cheer. All glory to our Lord and God for love so deep, so high, so broad, the Trinity whom we adore forever and forevermore. <laughs>